Greetings and welcome back. This is uh, part 10 of my autobiography. As I've already mentioned, I've uh, spoken about um, from early childhood, um, the schooling years, teenage years, up to becoming a young adult and having uh, some quite good success uh, in my 20s. Uh, now I'm going to um, just turn the clock back just um, a little bit from from there. During the late 70s and 80s, um, it was a very productive open match uh, era for me. Um, and as far as I was concerned, I was travelling around the country, entering teams and individual, individual competitions. Uh, and it was during this period, I was also very successful in a, in a business, uh, in my business dealings as well. Uh, yeah, during the 70s, I uh, decided, uh, I borrowed a little bit of money from my, uh, my old man, my papa, and um, I set up a tropical fish shop myself, which is something uh, which I always had uh, intentions to do, you know, from a young boy, because as I mentioned earlier, um, I was in the chocolate fish business for four years, it was my apprentice, so I learned enough to be able to basically um, run my own business. Anyway, I took on board my brother, Neil, um, who uh, at the time was working for the Inland Revenue, and uh, he was doing my books for me, and anyway, I, <laughs> you could see I was doing quite well, and um, anyway, I, I was paying him, um, obviously to do my books. And it, it, the business was getting, you know, quite busy and, and getting bigger and bigger. And uh, I needed help, really. So uh, I said to my brother, I said, look, you know, I know you're in the land revenue. I know it's a good job and, you know, it's a job for life. But really, um, in an entrepreneur world, which, you know, I, I knew he was, uh, I thought, well, why, why not, you know, join me, become a partner? And um, anyway, cut long story short, he gave up a secure job with the land revenue, the, uh, the, you know, the government and a, a pension at the end of it, to come with me in the tropical fish business. Uh, however, um, we uh, we were quite successful, um, opening up a shop, importing our fish and uh, and so on. And uh, as I said before, it's a great um, thing learning how fish uh, respond uh, in the, in the tanks and. Uh, you know, especially trying little things out, you know, in between my fishing days. Uh, anyway, um, cut long story short, uh, at one stage we decided um, to venture into another business, and that was the video business, video rental business, uh, which uh, leads on a little bit later to uh, how I managed to make my first uh, video uh, films of uh, fishing. So yeah, so as I said, the 1980s, uh, beginning of the 80s was quite successful um, because my business was running. And um, anyway, it did come to a stage where uh, the video business was taken off uh, in so big, you know, it was brand new. And uh, I remember opening up um, a small shop and they had the queues of people, you know, just wanting to go in and, and rent the videos. And uh, on the strength of that, I built up um, a couple of shops and... Um, and a, a few video rounds, and I had a quite a number of people working for me at the time. So yeah, so things were looking pretty good for me at the time, and it also gave me more time to go fishing, uh, which is what I wanted. Um, but then we did decide that Neil and I uh, to split the partnership. I would concentrate on the videos, and I'd let him, you know, carry on with the uh, chocolate fish business. Uh, now at the time. Um, uh, I'd, I'd only recently been married as well uh, to uh, uh, Patricia, uh, my um, uh, my wife, and uh, she she didn't like that at all. She said, "Oh, I made the wrong decision," and I suppose in a way um, she was quite right because uh, the video business really only had a short uh, span of life before all the big major companies. Uh, came in on board and uh, took over, you know, people like Blockbusters and uh, ABC and, and people like that. Anyway, uh, it ended up um, quite mutual between my brother and I, and he, he was quite successful, he carried on and uh, he actually, um, uh, he opened up a couple of other little businesses and uh, he, he bought the property the sh uh, the, uh, where we had our business and uh, he bought a couple of properties, so, you know, he was quite successful as well. 
and um, so that was it. So, but the main thing is, it gave me plenty of time to go fishing, and that's how I managed to finance my um, early years, uh, you know, in my 20s, uh, going around the country, fishing all these big major competitions. Now, at that time, the River Wye had become very popular as a match venue, and in fact, uh, especially on the lower part of the Wye, around Red Book, uh, Bigs Weir, um, and so on. Um, and this area of the Wye um, saw many matches, you know, especially over the weekends. Um, later on, we would then move slightly upriver above Ross on Wye to um, Hereford to Belmont. And um, this uh, Belmont section uh, saw our first uh, Winter League. Um, and, uh, you know, I was winning on a regular basis then. And I, I remember another double-headed win, um, winning on Belmont on the Saturday and then Biggs Weir on the Sunday. And that was 1984, yeah, so looking back on my records. Now the Winter League uh, on the Y became very popular and this was the time when uh, there was plenty of dace there and, um, you know, dace would dominate a lot of the matches. In fact, uh, I was second in uh, a Welsh National with 42 pound of chub on one occasion fishing uh, the bread method, you know, which uh, I was taught many years ago by uh, my mentor Larry Powell. Um, Ted Parry won that particular match. Uh, he had £48 pound a day. Uh, he was a Cardiff Nomad member as well. <laughs> uh, anyway. anyway, during this time I developed my skills for catching big weights of chub with the bread flake. And, um, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, uh, how I used to uh, attack it was, was maybe a bit different than others. I would mix uh, four gallons of breadcrumb, you know, two loaves, and I would just mix it up with uh, with breadcrumb, uh, you know, uh, baker's crumb that you, you could buy from the bakery, uh, or you, offcuts from the bakery, I should say. Um, then I would use um, flakes of bread on big hooks, uh, maybe, you know, usually about a size six hook. Um, uh, there was another bread at the time called energy roll. Uh, I don't know if it's available these days, but energy roll would stick on the hook um, rather than come off. Um, and uh, as I say, I don't know if it's available now, but it was it was like a tough uh, dough type of bread. And uh, it would stay on the hook for a couple of casts, which says you, you know, rebaiting. Because normally when you fish a bread, you go down the end of the swim, you strike it off and it comes off. And you, you're feeding the, the fish at the same time by doing that. But this energy roll used to stay on the hook. And um, anyway, um, as I say, when the chub got the taste of the bread, um, uh, you know, I, I would clean up on quite a few matches and uh, I was pretty successful at it as well. I suppose, you know, some of the highlights of my bread fishing was probably, um, uh, I came runner up in the uh, wide championships uh, a couple of times in the 80s. I uh, had an 84 pound of chub on one occasion and 82 pound another time. Um, again, it was, uh, I was just unlucky on one match. I, I got beat by, uh, by uh, two pound. To, to become um, the white champion, but uh, you know it's it has eluded me unfortunately. The white championships have never actually won it, but I've, uh, I've done well in it. I've done well in a charity as well, about a third place. Um, but as I say, uh, I'm going back many years ago on the way, and uh, th there were more chub there possibly. Uh, now these days there's more barbel, but um, you know the feeder seems to dominate a lot uh, of the matches there now. But anyway, more about that later. Yeah. In fact, I just remembered something now. Um, I remember uh, on the one white championships, um, I drew um, a section called Kapla. Now, in them days, the white championships used to hold 300, 400 people. The anglers would come along, and uh, the, the, you know the, there was uh, stretches of white that uh, hardly ever fished uh, that Hedderford owned. And, uh, and the, the section I drew that particular term was Kapla. Now, um, if you look on the map, it's below uh, Foundhope. Um, it was a few miles, you know, downstream of Hereford. Anyway, uh, I drew it uh, this one on this one white championships, and uh, who was next to me was um, Joe Brennan. Now, Joe Brennan is a very well-known Midland angler. Um, again, he was very successful in the 80s himself. And um, anyway, the week previously, he actually wrote an article um, in the Anglian Times all about bread fishing for chub. And, and anyway, drawing it next to him, I thought, oh, I got my work cut out here. I thought, you know, you know, uh, Joe, he's uh, he's quite good at bread fishing. I thought. Anyway, 
<laughs> the match started, and uh, to my surprise, he went out on the feeder. Mm. I went out on the bread, and uh, I, I started bagging. Um, uh, Joe did catch fifty pound on the feeder, but uh, as I said, I ended up with eighty-two pound a chub on the bread, and um, and I thought, you know, a strange way you should write about bread fishing, uh, catching chub on the Y, uh, and when he actually drew next to me, he didn't fish it. But uh, anyway, um, as I say, Joe was a very good, very good angler, uh, and I was very lucky to actually win it or win, um, you know, uh, beat him on that particular day. Yeah, so anyway, being involved in the World Championships and international duties in the 80s, um, especially our Cardiff Nomad team, uh, we had the fortunes uh, and, and, the, and the good luck of, of learning a lot of the continental methods and techniques, uh, and in particular bloodworm and choker fishing. Um, the team had learned how to locate and scrape our own bloodworm instead of buying it, you know, uh, at very expensive prices. Uh, you know, we would save a fortune, um, you know, by doing it, you know, by uh, scraping it ourselves and the team. Um, we had learned how to scrape four pints of bloodworm uh, in an hour, which is quite good, good going. Uh, all we do is simply flatten uh, an aluminium blade uh, and tape it to uh, like a broom handle. And what you do is scrape it over. Well, first of all, you've got to find a worm, a pond that has a worm in it. Now, not every pond has worm in it. I mean, most ponds have actually, you know, to a certain degree, the quantity. But you, to, to to get a good pond, you really need um, a pond where there's uh, dairy cattle or pigs or you know urine going in the water, and there's no fish. And what you'll find, you'll find more abundant of bloodworm, because uh, bloodworm is the uh, um, it's the midge fly, you know, and uh, um, it's it's uh, it's the worm that. that hatches into, into the midges. So um, anyway, if you can find uh, a good pond, now we did find one in a place called Wick in um, South Wales um, uh, and it became so popular that the villagers uh, um, put a ban up on it, you know, they, they actually had a, um, because we were going there sort of all times of day and a lot of anglers were going there scraping, you know, from the team. Um, the local council decided to uh, to ban it, ban us from doing it. So what we what we had to do, we had to go either very early in the morning or, or very late at night when uh, when there was nobody around. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, so as as we scrape, what we ha have to do, we have to. Uh, Stan Crowley, God rest his soul, he's now departed. He was a very good angler in the Cardiff Nomads, but he was a, a carpenter and he designed a, um, a wooden frame. Uh, and uh, a mesh frame inside. So what, when you scrape, uh, you put the worms on top of this mesh, uh, the worms would wriggle through to the bottom, leaving all the sediment uh, and all the leaves on the top, so you'd, you'd be left with neat worm underneath. And, um, you know, we, and this method, uh, we, could, we could get half a gallon in an hour quite easy. Um, and, of course, it gave us the advantage, especially uh, in the local fishing circuit, you know, and. Um, uh, in fact, I'll tell you a little story now of what, what happened one day. Yes, we, uh, on this one occasion, we all went scraping. We all ended up with like half a gallon of bloodworm. And uh, it was a South West uh, Super League. Um, and, you know, we, we, we were doing okay. But uh, anyway, this one particular match was on the Gloucester Canal at Hempstead. And um, anyway, uh, we all got prepared for this. And uh, we, we all had five pints four or five pints of neat bloodworm. Um, so anyway, we all went along and we all uh, basically uh, fished neat worm. Uh, didn't fish joker, you know, we just fished neat worm and we put it in our balls of ground bait. And um, uh, anyway, we, uh, we we absolutely obliterated the opposition. We won seven out of eight sections uh, and the other one was second. Um, Anyway, uh, it was such. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we had won the other section, I think we would have um, qualified automatically for the final. But anyway, but because of uh, our success, the organisers held an emergency meeting, you know, of the, of the team, and uh, afterwards they decided to ban the bloodworm from any future events, which is a shame, a real shame. Uh, in fact, I'll put a. Um, a picture of the winning team on the end of this uh, uh, on the end of this vlog.
Yeah, so anyway, uh, the 1980s also um, the Irish festivals have become very popular and especially uh, fishing in Iskillin and um, the festivals there. Um, it was a craze really for all the maturing match anglers and, uh, and this becoming a highlight of the year. Um, and it was at this time that I actually uh, befriended Kevin Ashurst. Um, and it was through, like, you know, the competitions uh, that I got to know Kevin um, on a personal level. And Kevin uh, and I, we were, we, you know, we quite often used to have a few drinks in the bar. And uh, you now Kevin was a charmer with the women. <laughs> and uh, we had some really good fun, you know, uh, during the festivities and especially in the evening. Um, <clears throat> Uh, now Kevin was uh, naturally gifted in, in most things he done, um, you know whatever, whatever he put his hand to. Um, not only is you know he's a world class uh, angler, but also I found out he was quite good at darting. Now I used to play darts, and uh, I actually used to play for the Super League um, back home in South Wales. And of course, on the Irish festivals, um, <clears throat> I started. Well, there was a competition, and I started playing. And on this one occasion, um, the competition was at the Killy Hevelin uh, Hotel. Now, unknown to Kevin, uh, you know, I was pretty handy. And uh, anyway, as it happened, there was quite a big entry, and uh, I actually ended up uh, playing Kevin in the final, and I beat him. <laughs> oh, but uh, I tell you what, but uh, you know, being a natural guy, Kevin. Um, it was hard to understand. He used to he used to say the Reet, and I I, I know what I meant what I meant to say. Uh, the, uh, am I okay? <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, Kevin, some great times, and um, he was also good at singing. And he he gave uh, a great um, uh, uh, song routine, uh, uh, "Cool Water," you know, and um, he sang that a couple of times there. Uh, oh yeah, he's good. But uh, also. Um, you know, on the fishing side of it, I believe uh, that he, he probably was the best fishing brain uh, in the business at the time. And uh, I know he mentored, uh, mentored a, a few anglers. Uh, I know Bob Nudd was very friendly with him. Uh, you know, in later years, I got on well. I get on with uh, Bob even today. You know, we um, through uh, the internet, Facebook, we, we chatted a lot. You know, uh, messages and uh, Dennis White um, and a few more. They they all used to look up to uh, Kevin. In fact, uh, I can remember Dick Clegg, uh, who just taken over as the English uh, manager, uh, and um, he quite often confided uh, with Kevin, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, discussing tactics and, um, you know, etc. in the World Championships. Um, and it was uh, during the uh, Championships in Ireland in 1982 on the Newry Canal that Kevin showed the world why he was number one at that time. More about that in the next vlog.